Like the disciples, we live in troubled times. News channel reports move from depressing to terrifying. And this poses a question. How do we live as Christians in a troubled world? The disciples are also living in troubled times, and now Jesus says he is leaving them. But he promises to provide them with all they will need, his spirit and his comfort. And that is his promise to us, too. These are what you and I need to live a victorious life. I struggled to take in all the truths and promises of this passage, and that gave me great sympathy with the disciples here. Since they arrived in the upper room, Jesus has washed their feet, predicted his betrayal and Peter's denial, and that he is going to the Father. He has told them that he is the way, the truth, and the life and that the Holy Spirit of truth is going to come and live in them. That if they have faith, they will do miracles. And if they remain in him, live in him, they will bear lasting spiritual fruit. Oh, and that the world hates them. Their brains must be spinning. On top of all this, they are struggling to reconcile their Jewish expectation of an all-conquering Messiah with Isaiah's suffering servant. And John is certainly going to need the Holy Spirit's help when he comes to record all this. So it is the Holy Spirit who is at the heart of this week's passage. He will reveal the truth about Jesus and expose the world's wrong thinking. He will enable the disciples to testify about Christ and give him all the glory. He will also strengthen them in their grief and bring them joy, peace, and victory. So we learn that the Holy Spirit exposes the truth and comforts believers. We will look at this in two divisions. The Spirit's work in chapter 15, verse 26, to chapter 16, verse 15, and the Spirit's comfort in the remainder of chapter 16. In verse 26 of chapter 15, Jesus moves abruptly from warnings of persecution to wonderful teaching about the Trinity and the need to testify about Jesus. He has already promised to send the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14 and verse 16, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. And then in verse 26, But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And so now we begin to learn about the Spirit's work. First, Jesus calls the Spirit the Advocate or Counselor, the one who speaks on behalf of believers before the Father. And he is also the Spirit of Truth. He both reveals truth and helps us understand it. But in verse 26, Jesus doesn't only talk about who the Spirit is. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. There are many passages in Scripture which give us glimpses of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. One God, three persons. But I think this passage, perhaps above any other, shows us Father, Son and Spirit working together toward the fulfillment of the plan and purpose of God, the redemption and transformation of a people who will belong to him. Jesus tells us that he sends the Spirit. He says this again in chapter 16 in verse 7, and that the Spirit goes out from the Father. This is the presence of the Father himself flowing into our lives. And then the Spirit testifies about Jesus. He is the Spirit of truth, and He helps us understand the one who says, I am the truth. So if Jesus is the truth, and this is the Spirit of truth, then He is the Holy Spirit of Jesus, the third person, our three-in-one God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
Verse 27 is, in a way, the conclusion to last week's study. Jesus, remember, warned his followers to expect hatred and persecution. So how are they and we to respond to troubles? Does Jesus say, go and find a safe place to hide? No. He says, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. After his resurrection, Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You are my witnesses, so whatever the consequences, you must tell the world about me. It is easiest to say nothing when faced with hatred or indifference, but Jesus says, tell them who I am. And he says this to you and me too. Share the gospel. Tell them what I have taught you about myself and how I have made a difference in your life. Jesus tells us that the Spirit will testify too, but this is not me witnessing here and the Holy Spirit over there. Peter in Acts 5 verse 32 says, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. You and I witness to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit given by God and living within us. And the knowledge of the Holy Spirit's presence will help us when we face persecution. So in chapter 16, Jesus adds encouragement to his earlier warnings, saying in verse 1, All this I have told you, so that you will not fall away. When you and I speak out Jesus' words, or demonstrate their truth by our actions, the world around us doesn't like it. And this often results in hatred, rejection, and persecution. Jesus' crucifixion is just hours away, and he wants to prepare his disciples. So he says, I have told you this, so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. But before sending the Spirit to help them, Jesus must return to the Father. So in verse 5, he tells them, Now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. Jesus is returning to the Father. Peter in chapter 13, then Thomas in chapter 14, each asked Jesus, where are you going? Assuming that he is going to a physical location where they could follow him. Now, he tells them explicitly, he is going to return to the Father in heaven who sent him. And now they don't ask. Is it finally sinking in that he is going to die? Recognizing their shock and grief, he says, Very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It is for your good. Everything God does is good. He always knows what is good. He always acts for our good. So let me ask you a question. Would you rather have Jesus with you as a man or the Holy Spirit as believers do today? Remember, Jesus is fully God, but also fully man. His physical body was limited to one place. If a disciple woke in the night and wanted to talk with him, he might be asleep or praying to his father. But the Holy Spirit is not limited. He is God, omnipresent, living inside everyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Without the Holy Spirit, we could not obey Jesus' commands. We could not endure persecution. He is God's gift, enabling us to live victoriously in a troubled world. So the Holy Spirit will be our advocate, but he also has work to do in the world. We see this as we move into verses 8 to 11. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The Holy Spirit will expose the error of the godless worldview. 
He will prove those who reject God and his son to be wrong first about sin. The world rejects the concept of sin, but sin at its root is a refusal to believe in God and to trust what he says. And the sin Jesus is talking about here is the specific sin of refusing to believe in him. Then the Holy Spirit proves the world to be wrong about righteousness. Righteousness today is seen as whatever is best for me. There is no absolute right or wrong. But scripture tells us no one is righteous. And deep down, we know this is true. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous. No one who does what is right and never sins. God says there is only one standard of righteousness, his own character. And the Spirit convinces people of the absolute righteousness of Christ, our perfect example of righteousness, right behavior, right words, even right thoughts. So the Spirit convicts us of our sin and reveals the error of our view of what is right. And the Holy Spirit also proves the world wrong about judgment. The world claims that hell was just a medieval concept to keep people in line. But God says that the prince of this world, Satan, is condemned and heading toward eternal punishment. In a 2015 poll in the UK, one in ten people said that if heaven and hell exist, they will go to hell. But they don't do anything about this because they do not believe that hell does exist. Scripture is clear. Everyone will be judged, and all who stand with Satan will be condemned with him. The world rejects the reality of sin, righteousness, and judgment, but the Holy Spirit will prove all these superficial ideas and opinions to be wrong. So the Spirit convicts us of our sin and convinces us of our need for a Savior. And now Jesus says, I have more to say, but you can't bear it now. He is a wise teacher, aware of the capacity of other people to take in information. And he tells you and me, too, what we need for this time and in this situation. So now he tells the disciples, the Holy Spirit is who you need for understanding God's truth. Verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Truth, but he also says, I am the truth. The Spirit does not lead you into strange territory. He guides you right into the Savior's heart. He shows you who truth is, what truth is, what it means for you, and how to live it out. And wonderfully, throughout all eternity, Jesus will always have more to say to us. And Jesus goes on, the spirit will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. The spirit will not speak on his own. The father speaks to the son who speaks to the spirit, who speaks to God's children, to you and to me. There is nothing he needs to add, nothing he can add to the truth that Jesus has revealed in his word. So we can ask, does what I think I am hearing from the Spirit match God's Word? If not, then it is not the Holy Spirit speaking. And the Spirit tells us what is to come. He will give to John the book of Revelation, but he also takes ancient truth and applies it for today. Without the Spirit, we cannot possibly understand God's revelation of himself. Then finally, verse 14. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus by revealing who he is and what he has done, by bringing people to faith, by maturing us in our faith, and by making us more like Jesus. The Spirit reminds believers who Jesus is, what he did, and what he is doing right now for you and for me, and what he will do when he returns. So, in his spirit, Jesus provides everything we need to stay close to him in this troubled world. We need to remember this truth then, that the Holy Spirit reveals the truth about Jesus and exposes the lies of the world. Principle. 
The Holy Spirit reveals the truth about Jesus and exposes the lies of the world. The Holy Spirit reveals the truth about Jesus and exposes the lies of the world. And so he enables us to glorify God in the trials of everyday life through our words, our attitudes, and our actions. Where do you look for help when life is tough? Do you reach for a glass of wine, the remote control, surf the web, or go shopping? Or do you rely on the Holy Spirit? Do you let him guide you, help you, right where you are, so that you can glorify God? So Jesus promises to send his Spirit to do his work in us. And in our second division, we see that he promises the Spirit's comfort in joy, in answered prayer, and in peace. He isn't going to tell the disciples anything they can't bear. And now he gives them hope in their grief. Verse 16, In a little while you will see me no more. And then after a little while you will see me. This sounds like a riddle. What does he mean? And that is what the disciples ask one another. They don't ask Jesus. But it is a good question to ask him. One we should ask every time we open the Bible. Lord, what do you mean? And so Jesus asks, Why are you asking one another? This is not a rebuke. He says it is okay to ask questions when you do not understand. But sometimes we do not understand his answers either. In verse 20, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. He answers the emotion behind the question, and he answers with a promise. You will see me again. Jesus understands that our toughest questions arise in pain and grief and brokenness, and he doesn't jump to problem solving or giving us a life principle. He acknowledges the emotion behind the question, and then he moves us on. So Jesus acknowledges their grief. Then he promises joy to follow the grief. You will see me again. You will rejoice and your joy then will be permanent. This will be the joy of victory in the midst of trouble. The joy of trusting his word, standing on his promises. And we too stand on the certain hope of seeing him again. And then he gives another promise we can stand on. The promise of answered prayer in verse 23. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. When you see me, you will have no more questions about this. Three times in chapter 16, in verses 7, verse 20, and here in verse 23, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you. He is saying, this is important, so pay attention. And the three things we are to pay attention to are, it is for your good that I am going away, your grief will turn to joy, and now, ask, and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Whatever you ask, for understanding, for joy, for strength to live by faith, even when you do not understand what God is doing, all these come through prayer. And Jesus says they will ask in his name. To ask in his name is to ask according to his character, to ask for exactly what Jesus would ask for. So we are to ask in God's will, according to God's word, and for God's glory. But to pray like this, we need the Holy Spirit. So do you ask the Holy Spirit to help you every time you pray? I don't. I should. The disciples will no longer be able to go to Jesus, the man, with all their needs and their questions, but he will be with them all the time through his Spirit. Sometimes I forget that. When life is hard, I ask people to pray for me. But Psalm 23 does not say, When I walk through the darkest valley, I will ask lots of people to pray for me. It says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests. Jesus says, Go straight to the Father through my spirit living in you, and your joy will be complete. And you can go to the Father because the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. 
That is verse 27. Jesus did not die to change an angry God into a God of love. He died to show us that God is love. And this loving God is a generous God who longs to give to his children, and his answers always display his love. That is why we can trust that he will always answer our prayers in the way he knows is best for you. So go to him, and he will answer. And finally, Jesus promises peace. But first, in verse 28, I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the Father and going back to the Father. He is the Son of God, and for him, the cross will not be a criminal's death, but the way back to the Father. The disciples reply, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things. Speaking clearly? Really? He never even answered their question. But he has told them how to handle troubling situations by taking their grief and pain and their questions to the Father in prayer. And they know God cares. The Father himself loves you. And that is enough. The promise of answered prayer is God's wonderful provision for troubled times. In this broken world, we walk by faith through the darkness, holding on to his promises, even when we don't have all the answers. To do this is victory, and it is peace. So Jesus replies, Do you now believe? Faith in him does not mean an escape from all trouble in this life, and Jesus knows that trouble can cause us to waver in our faith and sometimes to fail. So in verse 32, he says, A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. They will fail him, and so will we. But when we do, if we cry out to Jesus for help, we will know the Father is with us, too, by his Spirit. When we do not believe in this three-in-one nature of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we try to shrink God to fit our own understanding, and then we lose the truth and the wonder of Father, Son, and Spirit working together in our lives. But if we believe that God is eternally one God, three persons, we will experience that truth and wonder. And then we will know his peace. Verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Our greatest trouble is the fight against sin and temptation. Satan wants us to run away and hide in shame and fear and anxiety. But Jesus says, come to me and have peace. He has overcome the world, and because of that, we experience his victory. Through his Holy Spirit, we have peace in the midst of a troubled, godless world. And peace, remember, is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Peace in trouble. Peace poured out on us all day long because Jesus Christ has overcome the world. His victory does not mean that your life will always go well, but it does mean that the Holy Spirit gives us his power to live victorious lives in the midst of trouble, a victorious life that includes complete, lasting joy and peace in every situation. So our second principle is that Jesus' victory offers us peace and joy in this troubled world. Principle. Jesus' victory offers us peace and joy in this troubled world. An old story tells of a competition to paint the best picture illustrating peace. The winning image showed a great storm, dark clouds, lashing rain, and a raging torrent. And in a bush, in the midst of the turmoil, a mother bird sits on her nest in perfect peace. This is the peace Jesus offers you and me. Not the absence of trouble, but peace in the midst of pain and threats and grief. In this passage, Jesus explains the Holy Spirit's work, revealing the truth about Jesus and exposing the lies of the world. And he promises the Spirit's comfort and joy, answered prayer and peace. So are you experiencing his comfort right now? Jesus' victory offers peace and joy. So will you choose to claim peace and joy even when your world looks dark? And will you claim his promise to send his spirit to you? As you do, 
Will you then look to see how the Holy Spirit will give us his overcoming power to live a victorious life in the midst of trouble?